Um, most organizations should first take care of something far more basic, uh, and that is data integration. Um, so most companies or public agencies or nonprofits, they would benefit enormously from just being able to use the data that they already have. So they need tooling to import data from different data sources to get it together in a common format, pre-process it and make it in available to, um, for, for further analysis. And uh, this process is also known as ETL. Um, let me give you two examples of where data integration really can, can help you in, and uh, create benefits. The first is legacy IT. If your organization is younger than maybe 15 years, it is very likely that you have several IT systems that don't talk well to each other. So if you're a company, you might have one system for managing your orders, one for system uh, for managing your supply chain, and one for your marketing campaigns. And if you want to find out if a campaign had an impact on orders and if that had an impact on the supply chain, that's usually very hard because the data is in different systems. Um, a second example of where data integration can help is with open data. So today, public agencies and the data community, they are making lots of very interesting data available for free. Um, and most people can actually benefit from using those data. So if you do anything uh, that is related to, to our physical world, you can probably find interesting stuff in OpenStreetMaps, like building locations or information about land use or administrative boundaries. Um, but using those data and especially integrating that with your own data sources and with your business logic, um, that's a, a non-trivial task. Now, I've worked on a bunch of such data integration projects in the past, and while doing that, I have undergone a certain development in my solutions, uh, and I've, I've also repeated certain mistakes. And what I want to do today is explain to you that evolution um, to help you get off the ground faster when you want to build your own data integration solutions. Um, now, to manage expectations a bit, what I'm going to describe um, is working for small to medium-sized projects. It's not for big data. It's not for streaming data. Um, and if you also already have a very data-savvy setup and you have a professional data integration solution, then maybe that's also not uh, what you need. Um, also, I'm describing what works for me. Obviously, there are many other good ways of, of tackling that. Um, let's look a little at a little toy problem here for now. Uh, imagine you are bored with life. Uh, you are bored with where you're living, and you're bored with what you do, and you spend your day at the office doodling on your smartphone. Um, so you want to find out where to, where to move instead. Um, but since you're a, you're a data person, you don't decide where to move with your gut, but you use data. And if you look around a bit, you find that the European Statistics Office, Eurostat, they give you lots of interesting data on a regional level. Um, so, for example, this is a table that shows you the percentage of people employed in the high-tech sector um, by NUTS2 regions. And the NUTS2 region, that's a region that is typically between 800,000 and uh, two, no, three, three million people. Um, and for example, the, the region highlighted here, DE12, that's the region around Karlsruhe. And here, a uh, table tells me that in the year 2016, 5.6% uh, of the uh, employed population worked in the high-tech sector. Okay, that's cool. So you think that if I just want to do a quick analysis and visualiz visualization of that data, I can probably get away with just doing that in numbers or Excel or whatever your, your favorite tool is. So you start out downloading the data, put it in your tool, you do a lot of mousing around, um, and then you get your first graph. That is nice. Um, now, the table that I just showed you, it only had this four character code for the region. It doesn't tell you the region name. So you need metadata about the regions. So you download the metadata, put it together with your data file into your tool. Now you need lots more of mousing around because merging data sources in a point and click tool is usually quite cumbersome, but you get your output. Then you want to look at another variable, maybe unemployment. So you use a different data file, metadata, blah, 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 mouse around and you get another graph. You want to look at a third variable and by now you're already doing small mistakes in your mousing um, and your, your output is off, so you have to do it again. 
Um, and by now you're probably as fed up with the whole thing as I would be. So my first advice to you would be to put all your data operations, everything in code. Uh, that helps you to avoid repetitive work, gives you reproducible results, and it allows you to not repeat yourself. Um, so for example, all these Eurostats tables, they look kind of similar, so you can write one import function with a bunch of parameters, and you can read any of those tables with that import function. You don't have to do everything over and over again. All right, let's do that. So we take our tables, our metadata, and put them through a Python script, and we get our output. That's nice. We can now do that also for many of these tables and produce graphs. Um, and now we get greedy. We don't only want to see the Eurostats data, but you also want to have weather data because the nicest economy doesn't really help you if it's raining all the time. So you load your data, put the output in an intermediate file. Then you scrape weather data from the web and put that to an intermediate file. And then you have a third script that loads these two files and generates your output. Now you already see that this, this is quite a few snakes to wrangle here. Um, so because you have to remember in what order to run these scripts in order to get all the desired output. So my second advice to you would be to write a data integration pipeline that represents all of the tasks that need to run, including their dependencies. From that, you get automatic execution order. Um, you can do things like rebuild only what's needed. So if only one of your input files changes, you only change the output that depends on that input file. And you get a documented data flow, because everything that happens to the data is in the pipeline. Let's do that. So we have three tasks that each load one of these tables for us and put the output to an intermediate file. Then we maybe have one task that does aggregate statistics or benchmarking or clustering, also puts that to an intermediate file. Uh, we have our web weather data scraping task, and then our final task that loads all of our intermediate data and produces our final analytics result. Um, now you can probably also already see where, where I'm getting to. This is lots of intermediate files. And you have to remember what the format is, how you load them, um, how you join them up. And not only you have to remember it, but you also maybe have to tell that to a colleague. And that can be quite cumbersome. So my third and final advice here would be to store all your output data in a database in a clearly defined data model. So that documents your data structure. Um, it lets you define relationships between objects and entities, and it's usually much simpler to collaborate on a database than on a file basis. Because if you have described your data model reasonably well, you can talk to your colleagues about the data model. They don't need to know anything about the ETL pipeline if they just want to use the output data, so you have a very nice separation of concern between the data integration and the analytics front end. So how would you implement that in practice? What I like doing is use Luigi for the pipeline management because I find it very easy to use for small and simple projects. And I like to use SQL Alchemy for the database communications and to describe my data model. Um, so I'm use, usually using the, the SQL Alchemy ORM layer. ORM is for object relational mapping. And we'll, we'll see an example of that in a minute. And so what I did was write a small glue library that takes Luigi and SQL Alchemy and glues it together for the specific task of building data integration pipelines. By the way, these, um, these uh, QR codes only encode the URL here, so if you can scan them, you don't have to, have to type it. Um, and the, so the goal of, of this library called Ocelot is to reduce the amount of boilerplate code that you have to write when you want to implement your data integration solution. Let's look at some code. Um, so this class here called Eurostat value would represent one of the numbers from the table that I showed you in the beginning. So for example, value here would be 5.6%. Year might be 2016, so if I have several values for different years. Uh, I would have several of these entities of these objects in my database. 
Um, and then what I have here is relationships. So what I can do in the SQL Alchemy ORM layer is define relationships between objects. In this case, I have a relationship between my Eurostat value and an object that's called NUTS2 region here. Um, and this NUTS2 region object contains metadata about the region that I'm talking about. So for example, it would contain this four character code and the, the full name of the region. Um, now this relationship attribute here that is uh, the SQL Alchemy way of, uh, of following that relationship, so I can access the, the corresponding NUTS2 region object via uh, the, the region attribute. I have a separate column here called region ID that contains the foreign key reference to the specific uh, metadata I'm linking. So, so I'm linking each Eurostat value by this foreign key to one specific uh, metadata object about the region. Um, then I have a, a similar thing for uh, indicator here. So I have a relationship to an object called Eurostat indicator uh, that contains the metadata about the, the indicator. So for example, uh, the title percentage of people working in the high-tech sector or maybe a unit of measure or a source URL for the data. Um, and then I have correspondingly my, my foreign key column for this uh, indicator metadata. Um, what you get from Ocelot here uh, is that you get a nice base class for your ORM models. Uh, this contains a, a predefined uh, primary key attribute, so I don't have to define a primary key attribute here for my model. That's part of the base class. Um, it contains a predefined table name, which is derived from the class name. Um, and it has some handy management functionality for the database. For example, for creating the tables, uh, or deleting the tables um, that these objects map to. Because in the end, each of my, my ORM objects here maps to one table in my relational database. Now I can look at my whole data model here. Um, so here we have our Eurostat value object. By the way, the, the code uh, or glue code for generating these um, diagrams is also part of, of the Ocelot library. Um, so you have the Eurostat value object, and then you see that it has two relationships, one to the NUTS2 region object and to the indicator metadata object. And then I have a similar thing uh, called climate value here that would be uh, one value from my weather data, from my scraped weather data. And that has also relationship to a certain region, but also to metadata about that, that climate indicator. And then you see one final object here is called ORM target marker, and that is used to store task completion information in the database. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, now this is an example of what one task from my integ data integration pipeline might look like. So this class called NUTS2 regions, what it does is it loads the metadata about the regions and uh, spits it into my database. Um, and it has two important functions, requires and run. So this is kind of the standard uh, Luigi way of, of, of doing things. Um, requires yields instances of, of tasks that have to have run before this task can run. So all the require statements together, they kind of describe all the dependencies in my, in my pipeline. So in the end, they are kind of the, the edges in my dependency graph. Um, in this case, the only dependency I have is that a certain input file has to be present, and I have a task that represents this input file. Uh, then my run module, uh, my run method is, is what actually does the work. What I do here is kind of I, I load the input file. It's not really important how I do that here, but what I get is a pandas data frame. I iterate over the data frame, and for each row in my data frame. I build one of these NUTS2 region metadata objects and populate it with the name of the region and the key. And then I add these to my database session. Finally, when I'm done, I commit all my new objects to my database. I close my database session and I mark this task as complete. And what this last line does is um, it stores one of these ORM target marker objects in my database. Uh, so now Luigi knows that this task has completed and every task that depends on it can now run. What you get here from, from uh, the Ocelot package is a base class for these tasks. So they have this predefined management of this output target via the ORM target marker. Um, 
it helps you with database session management. So you can see, I can just, uh, just say self.session here and I get a database session. Um, and it has nice um, methods for managing your pipeline. For example, you can recursively check if a task and all the things it depends on are complete. And you can also do things like um, say one task, one input file is new, and I want to clear everything that's downstream from that task and rebuild it. And this is the complete pipeline graph for this example. So if we have these rounded rects. They just represent our input files. We have these regular rectangles. These are the regular ETL tasks, like the one we just looked at. Um, then we have these angled rectangles. Uh, they represent um, consistency checks. So I build consistency checks right into the pipeline. For example, they test value ranges or not nullness uh, or uniqueness. So I know that once my pipeline has run and is complete, um, the data I have in my database at least uh, adheres to these consistency checks. And then finally, I have these dotted rects here. These are wrapper tasks. Um, and they can be used just for, for pipeline management. For example, the rightmost task here is called load everything. Um, if I want to instruct Luigi to build the whole pipeline from scratch, I just tell Luigi build load everything. And since the whole uh, load everything depends on the whole graph, it will uh, run my complete ETL pipeline. So uh, all of this is documented at ocelot.wethodocs.io. And an important part of this documentation are currently two, maybe later more, tutorial style examples that walk you through the whole process of building such a data integration solution, including how to define your models, how to define your tasks, and then how to manage and set up everything. <clears throat> So now we have integrated all of that. Let's have some fun with the data. Um, of course, since the, the data is now in a relational database, you can hook this up to any front end you want. You can use, use Python code to, to do matplotlib plots. You can hook it up to Tableau or uh, ClickSense or whatever there is. Um, what I did here was write my own little uh, interactive explorer dashboard and this the code for this is also part of the of the repository uh, what you can do here is you can first say uh, i have a map here so i want to have one variable uh, on on the map and on the y-axis of the scatter plot so let's say i want the um, percentage of human resources in science and technology as the color in my map and i want that on the y-axis of my plot and on the x-axis, I maybe want uh, life expectancy. So now what I can do is I can push this play button here, and it will run through all the years that I have data for and play how that data developed over time. And what you see here now is the whole cloud moves to the top right. Uh, so in Europe, on a whole, both the percentage of people working in science and technology and life expectancy are, are improving. You can already guess that also from the name that this is inspired by the famous gap minder of Hans Rosling, but I'm not going to dance the data here for you like he did. Um, so let's pause that here and go to the latest year that I have data for, for both of these variables, it would be 2015. And now if we're going back to the problem of choosing, choosing where to move next, um, if I want to find a good place to move to, I'm probably uh, interested in this top right quadrant here of my plot. Let's maybe make that a bit smaller. So regions where I have um, lots of people working in science and technology and high life expectancy. So that already narrows, narrows it down quite a bit of wh where I could move. Um, but then I also want nice weather. So you see these histograms down here. They give you uh, the green ones here. They show you the mean precipitation per month in uh, that summer and winter. So, of course, there less precipitation is better, less rain. And these two show you the mean temperature in summer and in winter. So now I know that I want to go somewhere with lots of science and technology and high life expectancy. But I also want to go somewhere where it's not so cold in winter. Okay, so let's maybe put it like that. 
let's just take the tail of this histogram, and that already narrows it down quite much more, and then I'm not really speaking French, but I'm speaking a bit of Spanish, so let's narrow this down to Spain, and then I really like that place, so I guess I'm going to book plane tickets to Galicia tomorrow. So we have th solved that problem. Going back to my slides, before I leave you, I want to say a few words about uh, data integration and, and good software development. Um, these are points I've also heard in other tasks, but I think it's worth reiterating in other talks, sorry, but it's worth reiterating them here. Um, so let's, let's assume for a moment that I've convinced you that this is a reasonable way of doing data integration. Now you go and talk to your boss about it and say you want to try this out, uh, and your boss says, uh, why, why do you need all that complicated stuff and all that code? Well, why don't you just use a nice off-the-shelf point-and-click tool with a nice GUI where I can use my mouse? Um, or even better, just use Excel, right? Because then I can do my own edits to your data as well. Um, and now imagine the following. You really do this, and then you have a complex Excel workbook with lots of sheets and lots of complicated internal business logic. Three of your colleagues make edits to the business logic and to the data, and it's your job to join their edits and to figure out if everything still works as it's supposed to do. Well, good luck with that. If you are doing that, then you're probably building the, the legacy IT of tomorrow. Um, instead, what you should probably do is talk to your boss about good software development practices that may be obvious to you, but might not be to him, especially revision control. If you have all your data processing and all of it in code, you can do diffing, merging, tagging, branching, and real collaborative editing in the team. And the other thing you can obviously do uh, is you can do automated testing. Um, so you can either run unit tests on a portion of your data integration code and run that against um, a subset of test data, or you can integrate uh, consistency checks that check all of your data right into the pipeline. And uh, so I hope you can take away these points for discussions with your colleagues and bosses, and by that help them to choose open, flexible, and maintainable data integration solutions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eberhard. Is there any question for him? Hi. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about the um, the library that you developed, Utsalot. Is it tied to uh, SQL Alchemy? Yes. Currently, uh, it is. Would you uh, imagine a scenario where you'd like to use it, for example, with something like MongoDB or something where SQL Alchemy is you, you cannot use? Yes, that's that's certainly possible. I haven't done it yet because I haven't had a use case for it. Um, but I've, I've, I've had that request already. Uh, technically, it's, it's not an issue. You just need to, to uh, integrate another target for Luigi where it can store this task completion information in, and that target then would not be in uh, ORM model in SQL Alchemy, but it would simply be a certain, uh, I don't know, a certain collection and key in your, in your MongoDB. That's certainly possible, I just haven't done it yet. Great, thank you. So you said that um, the SQL Alchemy model is automatically creating and tearing down the database and the tables. And I was wondering, are the tables persistent in a way, or is it just transient for during the ETL process? Uh, they are persistent if you don't delete them. So <laughs> you need before you <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> if you before you run your your pipeline, you have to create your tables once. So 
I don't put the process of creating the tables into my pipeline usually because often I create the tables once and I have to run the pipeline many times till it works. Um, or I also have to update data. Um, but yes, it, so you have a kind of an initialization command which just creates all the tables. Then you can work with them as long as you like. Okay, and is there any schema migration magic in there like with Alambic? Or is it something you also have to do externally? Uh, not in here. I didn't want to reinvent that. So I would use Alembic for that. Yeah. Personally, for small projects, I still like the what's called the nuclear option, which is simply delete everything, uh, build a new schema from scratch, and re-import from scratch. That might not always be possible, but that kind of guarantees you that you don't, uh, um, do, you don't create internal inconsistencies. What kind of visualization tool here? And if I don't, uh, I change the, you, you take the video for a year and it's automatic change the time. But at the moment, I don't want to select the year. I want to change the, uh, the country, how it's to work. So this actually, I, I hate to admit it, but this is hacky JavaScript. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is just a demo. Um, so, the code for that is in the repository, but this is kind of separate from the, from the, the Python side. What Python is used for is that um, the JavaScript and the HTML is in a Jinja template, and I fill that Jinja template with Python from my pipeline, but then the actual visualization and how everything is shown and the interaction, that's cross-filter cross and DC and JavaScript, unfortunately. Okay, because actually uh, we use uh, some tool for visualization like Tableau or, or Spotify or SAS, and then we, we can do the same here. When we build in the client, uh, in our server, and then we port for clients, so they see only in the website and they see HTML. But in general, we do it in our merging, and we can manage everything here. So this want to create if we change country by year, how it's not. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Keep it. <laughs>